Hello, my friends, and welcome again to the Church of St. Anne's here in Toronto, Ontario. My name is Father Don Byers, and I serve as a priest and pastor here. The past couple weeks in our videos about Anglicanism, we've been taking a look at the liturgy and the sacraments. Today, I like to spend a little time, or in this video, I like to spend a little time talking about the church space uh, to give you a sense of some of the objects that you will see in Anglican churches and what their meaning might be. And we'll have some, as we do this video, we'll take some video as well of some of these different objects so you can sort of see what I'm talking about here. Hopefully you'll find this uh, very helpful as you learn more about Anglican Christianity. So Anglican churches, for the most part, have very similar objects into them. Whether you go to great cathedrals, such as St. Paul's Cathedral in London, or as some of you saw during the Queen's Funeral, uh, Westminster Abbey, uh, to the very smallest parish churches, you'll see these items that are essentially in every Anglican church. What makes these churches different is really more the scale, the huge size, that you might get, such as here at St. Saint Anne's, it's a rather large church. But even in small parish churches, you'll see these objects. And what I want to first talk about is the altar. And behind me, you'll notice we have our high altar. The altar is the central focal point of every church. Now, this is true not only for Anglican churches, but also for Orthodox, Catholic, Lutheran, any of the liturgical churches, we all have as our central focus the altar. Now you may notice that when you go into a church, you'll notice that people bow to the altar. And the reason for that is the altar is understood to be a presence of Christ. It's Christ's presence among us. This might be something new for some of you, is that in the Christian tradition, we see or encounter Christ through many different things, such as one another, such as through sacred scripture, such as through the bread, and also through the altar. So the altar for us is the very presence of Christ. And so you will notice that we bow to it, we reverence it. Uh, you'll even notice that as a priest, uh, many of us, we will kiss the altar at the beginning of the service and at the end. Now, in some places, not so much in the Anglican Church, but in Catholic churches, they will even have a little stone in the altar in which some relic of a saint will be pushed, uh, put in. Uh, that's not terribly common in Anglican churches, although in Europe, uh, in England, that is, you may see it occasionally. But for the most part, in our churches, you just have either a wood altar or a stone altar. Another feature about the altar is that in our church, for example, the altar is away from the wall. In the Anglican church, a priest can either face the people or face uh, sort of what we call liturgical east. It was custom in the early Christian church that when Christians prayed, they all turned to the east, to Jerusalem, as they waited the joyful coming of Jesus Christ in glory. And that's why priests often did not face the people churches traditionally were built in an east-west axis. Now, St. Anne's is a little weird in this. We're actually backwards. In this church, we're actually headed towards the west, uh, which was unusual. The only reason why it was done that way was simply because of where the street entrance is. It's actually on the east side here. So it was a misunderstanding that the priest put his back to the people. That was not the idea. Rather, the idea, and still is today, is that the priests, together with the people of God, are offering the great prayer of sacrifice and thanksgiving. Uh, that continues to this day. Even when the priests face the people, it's not about the priest. It's all about Christ, and who we encounter both at the altar, in the word, in the sacrament of bread and wine. So altars can take on many shapes and many forms. As I say, in most Anglican churches, they tend to be wood. Uh, however, you'll find many Anglican churches, such as ours, where the altar is made of stone. Uh, altars can be quite grand, they can be quite elaborate, 
In fact, in this video, I'll have a couple of images, some pictures I've taken on my trips uh, in other Anglican churches where you'll see these very ornate and beautiful altars. But every church has an altar, and the altar is the place where the great Eucharistic prayer is said, where we celebrate the Holy Eucharist. It's a focal point for that. Now, there are other focal points in the church. In many churches, you have a place where the priest sits, often with a deacon or subdeacon. That seating is known as sedalia, and we'll have it written at the bottom of the screen here. I'll give the word to Thomas. The sedalia is another important symbol in the church. It's symbolic of the royal priesthood of Jesus Christ. So the priest and the deacon and subdeacon participate in the royal priesthood of Jesus Christ. And so you'll have an, a chair or a place for the priest to sit. In some churches, like ours, there's another seat for the priest, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, but that seat is generally reserved for when we do morning and evening prayer. But generally, you always have a place for the priest to sit. In great cathedrals, you actually have what is what appears to be a throne. Now, it's not a throne. What it is is that it, it is the chair of the bishop. The bishop is the chief pastor of a diocese. And that chair in a cathedral is known as cathedra. It's a Latin word for chair. And this is how we get our English word for cathedral. A cathedral is the seat of a bishop. Its focal point is a chair. And in our church, we actually have a, a, a chair that almost appears to be a throne. The reason for that is historically in Anglican churches, the bishop is still the chief pastor here. And that's where he would properly sit. As a parish priest, I'm simply the bishop's vicar or rector. I stand in his place when I'm here. Another item that you'll see in our worship or a piece of furniture is what we call the ambo. The ambo, otherwise known as a lectern, is a place where sacred scripture is read. It's where the lessons are proclaimed to the people of God. Now, this comes actually to us from our Jewish brothers and sisters. If you go into a temple or a synagogue, you will often see what appears to be a large lectern in which the Torah will be proclaimed from. The same is true for us as Christians. The Holy Word of God is proclaimed from the spot. Oftentimes, just as here at St. Anne's, the lectern is often in the shape of an eagle, a symbol of the good news of God being proclaimed to the world. You'll see that very frequently, almost in every Anglican church, you will have a lectern that's shaped in the eagle. That's traditionally where the readings are done. Now, here at St. Anne's, uh, because everything is somewhat far from everybody, we also use another lectern on the floor, and that's fine as well. And I should say, we also use another altar here in the church. Sometimes we use the lower altar, sometimes we use the high altar depending on the season of the year or how festive the, the day is. The greater the festivity, we tend to go up to the high altar. But you'll see the lectern, and the lectern is a place where we hear Christ as preacher, the prophetic voice of Jesus Christ speaking to us. There's another lectern, an often grand one, known as a pulpit. Now, pulpits, as I say, you can go into some churches and the pulpit can be extraordinarily elaborate and ornate and can even be quite large. The pulpit is essentially the place where the priest or deacon or bishop uh, continues to proclaim the word. It's where they teach and where they speak to us as God's people. Uh, the reason why they're often so elaborate and often so large is to, they were built in that way to take advantage of the architecture. So it's only in recent time that we've actually had microphones. For the longest time in the church, there were no such things as microphones. So the way they would position a pulpit was done in such a way that it could actually help the voice of the priest uh, resonate through the church. And again, you see that here at St. Anne's. The pulpit is quite large, it's elevated significantly, and it stands just on the edge of the chancel 
in the sanctuary so that the priest's voice can resonate into both places. Now, Anglican churches have another feature that's really unique to Anglicanism. Uh, it's rarely seen, with the exception of monasteries and convents, it's rarely seen in Catholic or Orthodox churches. This is a feature that goes back to the earliest days of the church in England, and that is the choir. Right now I'm standing up where the choir is. Now, choir here isn't necessarily speaking of music, although that's right. What it's referring to is a space where those persons who sing the daily office would stand. Now, a little history about Anglicanism. The Church of England really emerged out of the Benedictine monastic movement. So you might have heard of Benedictines. Benedictines continue to this day. They are an order of monks. And monks, still to this day, will chant the daily office at multiple times of the day, not just at morning and evening prayer, but at several other hours throughout the day. And when they do, they often sit in benches that face inward to each other. And what you will encounter when monks chant the daily office is that one side will sing one part of a verse, or one verse of a psalm, and another side will respond with the other verse. And so you get a bit of what we call antiphonal singing, going back and forth. It's a very ancient practice in the Christian church. As I say, today you still see this in the Anglican church, and you definitely see it among Roman Catholic uh, monasteries uh, of nuns and monks where this practice will be done. Now the Church of England, at the time of the Reformation, all of its cathedrals were essentially great monasteries. Even Westminster Abbey, this is why it's called an abbey. Westminster Abbey, up to the time of the Reformation, was one of the great monastic abbeys or monasteries of the Christian church. And it was a place where monks gathered to pray the daily office. Now there are no longer monks at Westminster Abbey. Instead, you have a number of priests known as canons who do that work, who sing the daily office, who celebrate the daily liturgy. But up to the time of the Reformation, it was monks who occupied those benches. So if you watch like royal weddings, or if you watch like the, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, you'll notice that as the ministers and, and the whole liturgical party got into the sanctuary, they passed the choir and the choir faced into each other. Those benches were where the monks historically chanted the daily office. And then you go up into the altar, into the sanctuary area. Again, that's a very uniquely Anglican sort of structure. I would say probably even here in Canada, particularly your larger churches, most of them are built in the structure. Now, smaller churches generally are not because smaller churches, they simply do not have the space. I did work in one for a while, my previous parish, where at one time they did have a couple of benches, but since have removed them so that they can have more seating for the people. Uh, but if you go into, say, like our cathedral here in Toronto, St. James Cathedral, if you go to St. Paul's Bloor Street, Grace Church on Hill, uh, this parish, um, St. Thomas Huron Street, if you go to all these different churches in this diocese or throughout other churches throughout the Anglican Communion, you will see this sort of setup. And we still use it for the space of the choir. The singing of the daily office continues to this day in many Anglican churches. And this, here even at St. Anne's, we will be singing evensong here. So pretty much doing the same work that the monks did, only lay people do. And that's another reason why actually the choir wears robes. It's a memory from when monks used to do these services. So that's a very unique Anglican sort of environment. There's another item, and it's just over here to the side, and we'll take a video of it. In Anglican churches, like Roman Catholic churches, we reserve the leftover communion into a, a case that we know as, as we know as the ombre 
or it's sometimes referred to as the tabernacle. The reason why we do it is not only because we acknowledge that the bread and wine are the presence of Jesus, we believe that Jesus is present in them, we do it so as to be able to bring communion to those persons who were not able to join us on Sunday. So I, as a priest, often visit with parishioners who are often at home and unable to come to church for health reasons or for various reasons. So during the week, I will go to the Ombre, I'll take some of the communion, and then I will go to their homes. And this was a very ancient Christian practice, going to the very earliest of days that people understood that some Christians were unable to come to church because of health. And so they, they would always reserve or keep some of the leftover sacrament so that we could bring it to people during the week or on Sundays. And so we do that too. Again, the ombre or tabernacle can be quite simple like ours. It's just a simple wooden box with an icon of Jesus Christ on the front. Or you can have some that are quite ornate and quite large. Um, there are some even, a fascinating one, and I'll give Thomas a picture of this to put in this video. There was a church in, in London, England, All Saints Margaret Street, a beautiful, beautiful church. There, they don't actually have a box or a case. The leftover sacrament is put into a, a little case that is lifted up and hung up from the ceiling and only lowered during the time of service so that the priest could put the sacrament in. Uh, you see this in France as well. In some parts of France, the reserve sacrament is in a case that looks like a bird, like the Holy Spirit, and is, is hung by the ceiling and only lowered so that the priest can put the sacrament in. So it's really quite fascinating to see this. But most Anglican churches have this. Most Anglican churches either in the main sanctuary have it, or if you go to cathedrals, like our own cathedral, St. James, they will have the sacrament reserved on a side altar. And the reason for that is they acknowledge that their church is often visited by many tourists and has concerts in it. Even here, when we have a concert, we remove the sacrament to the sacristy, just out of honor of the holiness of that. One final part of a church or sanctuary that I'd like to talk to you about, and that is the assembly, the pews, that big space out within the church. Well, that may seem like just ordinary seating, it may not seem like anything significant. It is actually a rather important space. Christian churches, no one space in the church is more holy than another. The entire church is holy. It's a sanctuary. It's a safe space. A space where people can come to worship and experience the presence of God. Uh, our church plays off of both Roman Catholic and Orthodox themes in that in the ancient Christian church, they understood the whole church to be heaven. That when you came into the church, you entered into heaven. Even here in Toronto, if you look above the main door of a church, you will have a Latin inscription that says, Porta Celli, or Gate of Heaven. And so the ceiling, even here in St. Anne's we have this, the ceiling will have stars on it. There will be blue paint over some of the side parts or even in the dome. All that is to give the sense that you are now entering into heaven. You are no longer within the ordinary world. You are now in the Holy of Holies. You are in the very presence of God. And so all of us, all of us are the people of God. And all of us are a priestly people. Martin Luther talked a lot about this. All of us share in the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. And that is to pray, to offer prayers and sacrifice for the people of God. And those that sit in the assembly, in those pews, have a major role. You are just as important as the priest in that all of us have a role to play in offering the great hymn of thanksgiving and praise to God in the Eucharist, in the daily office, and whatnot. One little word about that. It's only been relatively recent in Christian history that pews have been used in the church. And in fact, even if you go into the Orthodox churches, you will often not find pews in them. Pews were a later addition to churches, and mainly because 
the proclamation of the word or the sermon became more prominent in those communities. So people would want to sit for that portion. Uh, pews, I think many of them really first began to appear in churches in the 16th and 17th century. But for most of the church's history, you did not have pews within the church. Rather, everybody moved during the service and you would have great processions. And if you ever get a chance, go to an Orthodox church, particularly if you're, say, in Greece or, or in Eastern Europe or in the Middle East, you will find that many of the churches don't have pews. But that space is still considered holy. It's where the people of God dwell and you know, worship. One final little thing that I want to give a hint, and that is the communion rail. Communion rails are common not only in Anglican churches, but Lutheran and Roman Catholic, not in Orthodox. But in these churches, it's been tradition that when we receive communion, we kneel. The communion rail also harkens back to a day when there was what we call a rood screen between the congregation and the sanctuary. So again, if you were watching any of the royal ceremonies, you would have seen that the clergy and ministers went through a little door of this big screen or wall, wooden wall, that separated the altar area and the choir from the congregation. And that is known as a rood screen, R-O-O-D. Now rood is another, it's an old word, English word for the cross. Because in many of these churches, that screen, that wall, would have a big crucifix or cross at its top. And it was understood that you passed through it to enter into the Holy of Holies. Uh, it's much similar to say what the Orthodox churches have. They have what is known as an iconostasis or a wall filled with icons. And you can only see the priest through certain doors. Anglican churches have that as well. Now we don't have that here at St. Anne's, but some of the remnant of that is the communion rail because there was some sense that the very Holy of Holies, the, the chancel, was a place, unfortunately, I'll say this, was often a space where only certain persons could go in, namely the priest or ordained ministers. That's less true today, no, but it was the case uh, for a long period in the church's history. And even in Orthodox churches, uh, an ordinary lay person cannot actually enter through the center door only the priest or bishop can. So you still see it in some Christian communities today. Here at St. Anne's, we may use the communion rail again in the future. We suspended it because of COVID, but at some point we may go back to using it again. Uh, it's not necessarily better than standing. It's just another way in which people traditionally receive Holy Eucharist. I hope you found this video helpful. As I say, I'll work with Thomas. We'll put some pictures of different things. So not only can you see what we have here at St. Anne's, but just to see how altars look different in other churches, how the tabernacle can appear different in different churches. Uh, but generally speaking, you always have these items within an Anglican church. Next week, my friends, we're gonna talk about vesture, about the vestments that a priest wears, as well as servers and choir members and deacons and bishops. We're gonna talk a little bit about those vestments and show you and explain why do we wear vestments. Hopefully these videos will help you better understand what it is that we do when we celebrate sacred liturgy. As always, my friends, know you're welcome here at St. Anne's. We always have Eucharist on Sundays at 10.30. And we'll soon be starting daily morning prayer here at 9.30 from Tuesday through Friday. You're always welcome to this church. And of course, if there's anything you need, you're always welcome to speak with me. My friends, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God let his face shine upon you always. God bless.